focusing on Thank you. <laughs> we're going to be focusing on clinical populations and we're going to be talking about interventions that address loneliness and social isolation within clinical populations. So I guess without further ado, I will hand over to the first speaker, who is George, George Waddle. Just to let you know, everyone, like the other breakout sessions, I will let you know when you've got two minutes remaining of your presentation. Is that all right, George? Sure. Um, are, are you happy? <clears throat> oh, pardon me. Are you happy to wait for two forty start? I only ask because I can see my colleagues haven't yet arrived from the break, so they're yeah. probably seeing a bit early. You know what? I was thinking nobody that we didn't look quite ready, and it's because my computer says two forty. Oh, uh, how, I, I think it's we've just come on two thirty eight for the moment, I believe, unless my clocks are wrong here. No, you're absolutely right, and I did. I was aware of this because I just noticed that my phone was different to the computer. Sorry, everyone. Not a, good for all of us to sort of be on the ball <laughs> and raring to go. So I've just done a practice, a dress rehearsal of my um, my little introduction. So I'll just wait for everyone else to join. Thank you. Would you like me to go ahead and share my screen just so that is ready to go once, once you are? Um, or or yeah. shall I wait? Why don't you wait? Yeah. And we'll see if others join. Um, and then we'll start in a minute or so. Is, yeah, Thomas is with us. Dora is with us. Simon is not yet, is he? But I guess. Okay, it is now correctly 2.40. I'm going to do that intro again, just in case anybody wasn't at their computer. So hi, everyone, and thanks for attending this breakout session. So this is on interventions to address loneliness and social isolation within clinical populations. And we've got four speakers lined up. My name is Gemma Lewis. I'm a psychiatric epidemiologist at UCL Division of Psychiatry, and I led one of the Pathway Plus projects. So I'm going to be chairing the session. So George Waddle is our first speaker. So I'll hand over to you, George, if you want to get your screen set up. Whilst you do that, I'll just say to all the speakers, it's 10 minutes of session, and I will let you know when you've got two minutes remaining. So I will hand over to George at that stage. Well, thank you very much. Um, and, and thank you all for, for joining us. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm George Waddell. I work at the Royal College of Music, um, and I'll be presenting about the, the songs from home uh, project, which is one of the, the projects funded uh, by this particular network. And um, I'll say right off the bat that I'm here on behalf of, of, of a wonderful team. It's really been a privilege to work with them, um, a, a team spanning um, academia as well as practice. Um, you'll be hearing in particular from Emily in just a few minutes. Um, uh, this is the core research team. Um, this project was also, of course, made possible by those who actually led the interventions and facilitated the interventions that I'll be speaking about. So many, many thanks uh, to all of those who have been involved. So the, the Songs from Home uh, project aimed to, uh, to tackle the issue of loneliness and postnatal depression among new mums. Now, for Tom, I'm going to skip over the sort of conventional background and literature. I think we all know what the issues are, the, the, the challenges faced by new mums, issues of loneliness, issues of postnatal depression. We also know of uh, in the literature of the, of the potential benefits of arts-based interventions, and particularly interventions that have been tested in person, whether it's uh, singing um, or music making, lullabies with and without children present, all these kind of things. Well, what this 
particular project wanted to do is look at the potential benefits of these interventions in an online setting um, and uh, um, you know, pushed not just by COVID, but also the general challenges faced, um, particularly by new parents and new mums in making it to physical geographic locations, can we take the benefits of these interventions online? Um, we went with songwriting because that uh, was more conducive to the online setting. And what we wanted to see is in a random controlled trial, um, can we see reductions of loneliness, reductions of symptoms of PND, and the enhancing of social connections um, after a six-week intervention? So I've mentioned the, the goals of wanting to take this online. Emily is going to speak about this more in just a, a few minutes. Uh, I'll just say that these were designed uh, co-creatively um, with focus groups, um, with new mums, as well as our PPI and um, lived experience partners. And again, Emily is going to say more about these in a moment. Uh, these were conducted uh, via Zoom, um, as well as uh, um, uh, asynchronous material available on the platform Trello. Um, so I'm planning forward quickly here because I want to hand over to Emily. Um, so the way this works is, is we had a six week intervention. Um, so our main outcome measures loneliness, postnatal depression, social connectedness. These were measured at baseline also to check eligibility, which I'll come to next. Um, loneliness was measured every week, whereas PND and social connectedness was measured at right at the end of the six week intervention. And then we did a, a follow up uh, four weeks after the end of the intervention. Um, there was also um, a, a parallel arm of the study that looked at aspects of shared understanding. So to what degree did uh, women taking part have a similar experience? And uh, we also did an evaluation of the intervention itself. I won't be speaking about those today, uh, but you can look forward to the published results of those uh, in the future. But I'm going to be focusing um, here on the results of our three main outcomes. Now, this was uh, delivered in four groups of about 12 women each. Um, so you can see these took place uh, sort of two days a week in two groups, as well as over two time periods. Um, there was also a, a randomly allocated control group. And that those that were assigned to the control group were offered the opportunity to take part in optional workshops later on. So everyone did have a chance to take um, part in those workshops. Um, now, the uh, women were um, uh, randomly allocated to uh, intervention or control, though that was done with some stratification to try to balance um, baseline uh, loneliness and postnatal depression scores, as well as the age of their youngest baby. Now, eligibility was any woman who had a baby who is nine months or younger, and um, some degree of loneliness or symptoms of postnatal depression as reported in our uh, eligibility tests on the mainline uh, primary outcome measures. Um, we had a, a total um, main N, as it were, of, of 89 women who started the intervention and control, which was great. That exceeded our target um, for the study. And, and you can see some details there of, of uh, those assessed for eligibility, as well as those um, for whom we were able to collect the follow-up data. Now I'm going to come straight on to the results. Now these are under review at the moment, so we would ask that we, to some degree, keep them within the community and, and, and not share these particular um, charts, but we're very happy to share them with you today because we're very excited about them. So if you look at the main outcome measure of loneliness, what do we see over those six weeks? Well, we see a quite rapid divergence of our control group and our intervention group. So by week three, we already see a significant difference. That difference increases um, through into week four. And then um, you, you'll note as well, between week six and the follow-up, there's essentially no difference. So really nice persistence of effect um, at four weeks um, after the end of these interventions, where loneliness has significantly dropped um, uh, within the intervention group. We see a very similar story in postnatal depression. So at the end of the six weeks, postnatal depression has significantly dropped compared with control. And that difference has in fact increased four weeks later at follow-up. And with uh, social connectedness, um, as one might hope, um, we see uh, social connectedness increasing uh, in our treatment group. And in fact, it was con uh, continuing to decrease in the control group, um, leading to that significant difference at the end. So that's really the, the whistle stop tour of the project and the results. What I'm now going to do uh, and I'm happy to do is hand over to Emily Tregett. Um, Emily is the co-founder of Happity. Um, an online resource for, for new parents. Um, and and uh, she and her group were really instrumental at all stages of the project. Now, she was hoping to speak to you directly, but unfortunately, COVID has hit the household. So she sent over a video. So I'm going to hand over to her digitally now. Whoop, let's try that again. 
Hello, my name's Emily Tredgett. I'm a mum and a campaigner uh, in the mental health arena. Um, I've also co-founded um, Happity, which helps parents find baby and toddler classes um, with a view to reducing loneliness because we know about the link between loneliness and mental health struggles. Um, I was really excited to be um, asked to be part of this project, um, not only because of my experience of uh, mental health issues, but also I was a musician growing up, um, not that I've done that very much recently. Um, and I actually put um, a lot of my um, recovery down to singing as I used to drive to my therapy sessions and wonder whether it's more the singing um, than the therapy in some in some areas. Um, I have had a lot of experience of online classes which obviously these uh, sessions we're talking about today were um, during the pandemic however I haven't come across uh, songwriting that's not something I've, I've experienced before so being part of this uh, project was really really exciting. Um, I'm going to briefly share with you today how the workshop was designed uh, based on the needs of the mums and um, what the project results uh, mean for mums and also for my work uh, at Happity. So firstly, it was really important with this project to ensure um, that we set it up in a way that would help mums. So we reached out to new mums um, and formed some focus groups initially. Um, these were really, really informative um, and we had a few key takeouts. Uh, for instance, the sessions needed to be uh, for mums, not entertainment. And this is something that mums can find a little bit difficult. They sometimes feel quite guilty about taking me time. It was also discussed how important it was for the mums to be able to spend time connecting and building friendships um, aside from from the songwriting itself and thirdly how important it was to make something tangible um, for the mums to feel a sense of achievement as that's something that can be lost uh, with the lost sense of self that, that many of them particularly struggling with mental health um, might feel. We obviously also talked about the practicalities of being a mum attending the sessions obviously from having them online making it easier to attend to interspersing them with songs um, to entertain little ones throughout. For new mums, this will be such amazing results to hear about. Um, it shows that a relatively simple thing they can do um, to help themselves uh, can have a really big benefit. Um, and the results really were uh, very obvious in, in that way. Um, it will be important to stress going forward that something like this requires no musical ability. Um, however, I can see um, this research being used in different ways. Um, some mums might sign up to music sessions in general, others to songwriting in particular, um, and others might just take it as an encouragement to join a choir or start playing or singing um, again or pick it up uh, to start because it's something very simple around the house you know you don't need a musical ability maybe you don't want everyone listening if, if you don't feel like you're the greatest at it but you know it doesn't cost anything and further, if this results um, and these research can be used to help fund songwriting sessions, this will help so many new mums and families around them. Uh, and I'd absolutely love to see this um, results shared with Andrea Ledson um, for the new family hubs that are being set up um, and planned at the moment. Um, and obviously, I'd love to share it with the thousands of activity providers um, who use Happity um, and see if it's something they can get involved with. Um, I, I spoke to many government ministers during COVID about vouchers for classes in lower economic oh, one, areas. One minute left, and I George. see that research like this could really start something like that. Um, if we could start with something that, you know, really, really shows a huge impact. Um, and obviously Boris announced, I think it was two weeks ago, the extending the childcare support to after school classes. Um, whilst this doesn't yet cover um, the baby years, research like this could obviously highlight the need for support and may even get some funding further down the line, which would be really exciting. Um, I look forward to seeing songwriting, music um, being used to support new parents um, with their mental well-being. And of course, we'd love to discuss further any ideas with you about how Happy Tea um, or myself can help support in this way. Um, apologies for having to send in a video. Covid has once again hit my household. However, if you would like to ask myself any questions or want to get in touch and um, with any uh, ideas of how um, we could help get this research making a real impact and um, definitely do i'm emily at happity.co.uk um, and i hope to hear from some of you soon thank you so thank you all very much and while i give you just a few seconds to look at our contact information allow me to just share a few seconds of one of the lullabies that that were, were written coming out of this project <laughs> We both run out of clothes, being covered in sick. All together. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, George. That was a really interesting presentation. Thank you to you both. Um, okay, we are going to move on. We'll have time for questions at the end. We've got 15 minutes, but 
And now we'll move on to the next presentation, which is from Thomas Cawthorn. So Thomas, do you want to share your screen? I'll just reset my clock. Yeah, I should have done now. Is it is it kind of worked? Um, yes, it has. If you just pop up to the beginning, can you put on screen? Great. Oh, pardon, sorry, I didn't hear what you said there. No, you're fine. You've just put yeah. it on speaker view, so, that, so that's great. All right, when you're ready. Uh, yes, yeah, so my name is Tom Cawthorn. I'm a final year trainee clinical psychologist at Royal Holloway, and this is my thesis project on the development and preliminary evaluation of CBT for chronic loneliness in young people. <clears throat> um, so just to say before we start, um, it was very much kind of a team effort. So my primary supervisor was Roald Shafran. Um, also, we worked with kind of a team from kind of Sweden and also um, from um, my supervisor at Royal Holloway as well. Um, and a big thank you to all the families that kind of took part and to um, the people who gave PPI feedback and to Georgia Jerwood as well, who um, gave us feedback from the uh, Loneliness Network. So the kind of the reason why we kind of did this study is we know that chronic loneliness is a really significant problem in young people with around kind of 10% of uh, people saying that they often feel lonely and around kind of 40% of young people either kind of consistently scoring as kind of um, being high levels of loneliness or having loneliness that is moderate and kind of gets worse um, for our adolescents, which really shows that interventions are needed because loneliness kind of isn't going away on its own. Um, and we also know that the population of young people at risk of loneliness is very heterogeneous. So it includes those with chronic health problems, those with mental health difficulties, those who are LGBTQ+, and those on the autism spectrum. And of course, as we've spoken about kind of today, we know that loneliness is associated with kind of poor outcomes, both in terms of kind of mental health and physical health, which is why it's a really important area to provide interventions and support. So the real difficulty in terms of current interventions for, for loneliness in young people is that though there are kind of interventions for young people who are at a higher risk of loneliness, which have been shown to reduce loneliness as a secondary outcome measure, there are not kind of interventions specifically aimed at young people who report loneliness as their primary difficulty. And also the difficulty is that kind of current interventions haven't kind of differentiated between transient kind of more temporary loneliness and chronic loneliness with it suggested that these kind of chronic um, loneliness difficulties will require a different type of intervention that really targets the underlying kind of anxieties and negative cognitive biases. And a further limitation is this kind of current evidence base just hasn't really used controlled experimental designs in terms of interventions for young people. So kind of why CBT? So the, um, the reason we kind of chose a CBT intervention, um, firstly, um, one kind of large scale systematic review by Maisie et al found that CBT interventions for adults were the most effective, which suggests that this may be the case for young people. Um, and also recently, um, a few um, online CBT based interventions for adults based on a modular formulation, which was by Anton Cal um, et al have been shown to be effective as well. And as we know that the um, group of young people who present at kind of higher rates of loneliness is very heterogeneous. This really kind of suggested that a modular formulation would be really important. So one that doesn't have a one size fits all approach, but instead is made up of kind of different modular treatment options that can be kind of chosen with the young people based on their kind of individual need and individual kind of formulation. So the um, intervention that we developed for our study was kind of very much a greatest hits approach. So it wasn't like we were trying to reinvent the wheel. We were really taking interventions that had been shown to be effective for young people for different types of difficulties. So for example, uh, things that we've known have been effective in terms of social, social skills interventions, like the peers um, intervention, the groups for health intervention in terms of finding friends and um, different parts of different CBT interventions. So we took kind of a lot from the MATCH intervention, which is a modular intervention for young people uh, with a range of difficulties, um, and also some, um, we took some work from the kind of the CBT for kind of social anxiety work as well, um, as well as um, kind of translating and adapting elements of the online intervention developed by Anton Cow, um, which again we kind of made and talked to be more suitable for children and young people. So what we did is we did a randomized multiple baseline single case experimental design with seven 11 to 18 year olds. And for those who don't know, a single case experimental design, instead of kind of measuring just at the beginning, at the end, you measure the primary outcome measure. So we did a three item only scale multiple times across the baseline phase, across the intervention phase and across the post intervention phase, which allows you to kind of see change over time. And because this is a high quality design, it also allows us to kind of suggest that there's a causal change as well. Um, and the research assessments were completed by an independent kind of researcher who is blinded to baseline allocation because, you know, as we spoke about in the previous literature, there's been a kind of a real lack of kind of high quality controlled designs and therefore this was something we really wanted to, to implement here. 
So there's kind of briefly talking about the outcome measures. So as I said, the primary outcomes is the free item learning scale, the secondary outcomes kind of the UCLA learning scale, kind of the RCADs, the SDQ, and then looking at the process measures around visual analog scales, goal-based outcomes and experiences service questionnaires. So um, for our study, we had seven participants. However, only six of them are presented here uh, due to delays caused by, uh, they had kind of COVID. Um, and the sample was very diverse in terms of kind of three of them had autism, one had treatment resistant epilepsy, one had an undiagnosed eating disorder, one had sensory processing disorder. Um, and several of the young people were presenting with kind of self-harm and kind of risk um, issues as well, which had to be managed alongside the intervention. Um, so it was really, kind of I think quite a good sample in terms of being very representative of the diverse groups of young people who present with loneliness and also the kind of the complexity as well um, that's seen by kind of CAM services in the UK. So in terms of the intervention plans it kind of really varied from person to person there's a kind of a brief overview there of showing the different uh, kind of treatment modules for the different young people so everyone had the same assessment and formulation of psychoeducation models over the first two sessions and everyone had relapse prevention at the end but as we spoke about the kind of treatment modules throughout were very much based on their kind of specific formulations and um, their goals and chosen in collaboration with the young people and their families so in terms of the results then so um, as you can see, here is the results on the primary outcome measure for the six young people showing the change across the baseline intervention and post intervention phases. So three of the young people showed a really strong kind of response to the intervention scoring basically zero on the loneliness scale um, at the post intervention period. Two of the young people here and here also showed quite a strong response as well. I think the thing to point out with these two young people is that the post-intervention phase was during their GCSEs, which I think you can understand for, for anyone uh, that could lead to kind of more periods of dysregulation. Um, and this is the third young people who person who showed less of a strong response. Um, and they were the young person that presented with treatment resistant epilepsy, which I'll kind of talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. In terms of the statistical analysis of the primary outcome measure for all young people, it was significant at the P equals 0.11, uh, less than 0 0.001 level. Um, and this was also the same for the weighted average across the groups as well. In terms of the secondary outcomes kind of presented here, so there was um, kind of a reduction across all outcomes, a large effect for the UCLA um, LS3, as well as the child and parent report RCADs and the parent report SDQ impact with a small effect for self report SDQ impact. Uh, but I think this was due to the fact that actually at baseline young people scored quite kind of low. So there was less space for movement as with the parent report where the parents scored at baseline, there were very high levels of difficulties uh, for the young people. These are the kind of the goal based outcomes. So we can see a broad pattern of kind of going up, which we want to see. So we're moving towards the goals across the period. Whereas for loneliness, again, we can see a broad pattern of going down, though again, there's some uh, individual variability with the young person as they start their GCSEs, particularly having kind of more variability as well. Um, again, anxiety, broadly speaking, kind of we're moving kind of downwards again, um, as with mood, um, except for this young person here, where it was quite stable throughout. And again, this is the young person who had treatment resistant epilepsy, who showed a kind of a lot weaker response to the intervention um, as well. Two minutes to go, Tom. Great, thank you. In terms of feasibility and satisfaction, so we met our recruitment target. All participants were recruit, uh, were retained throughout the period um, as well, uh, and we got good kind of um, positive feedback from the parents. So the key themes were they found it kind of helpful and fun, felt understood. A really important part for lots of the young people was around the fact that we adapted the intervention to their individual need, and lots of young people and parents spoke about that as well. Um, and lots of young people and parents also spoke about the importance of the practical kind of skills um, and the practical uh, skills we taught them in terms of kind of arranging things with friends um, and finally several young people spoke about how they were able to kind of attend an online intervention that they wouldn't have been able to do face to face due to their social anxiety. In terms of the, the, the discussion, um, just very briefly, so I think the intervention shows preliminary evidence that CBT for chronic loneliness in young people is effective for reducing loneliness and there does seem to be some evidence that there was a kind of reductions in mental health difficulties, though we can't show kind of causality for that due to the nature of the design. In terms of, I think, for what the intervention was particularly effective for, I think it was really effective for young people whose loneliness was maintained by anxiety, kind of bullying, specific problems, or kind of difficulties with quite complex friendships, which was a kind of a current, um, quite a key theme as well. I think for the young people it was less effective for was thinking around these ideas of young people with um, kind of health problems and the kind of relationship between kind of health problems and kind of identity. 
And due to the fact that the study was conducted in the COVID-19 pandemic, we weren't able to do kind of things around kind of engaging with kind of support groups or engaging with kind of other groups of young people with similar difficulties because they weren't kind of open at the time. And I think particularly thinking about the young person with epilepsy, that would have been a really important part of the intervention for her. Um, and then kind of finally, um, just thinking about the kind of overall theme. So it was kind of really positive to hear the feedback from the um, parents and carers in terms of the intervention and the modular approach seemed to be particularly effective in terms of adapting the intervention to different groups of young people and I think we now need to think about well how can we best kind of take this intervention and make it kind of meaningful in terms of positively impacting the huge numbers of young people who are presenting with chronic loneliness whether that's thinking about dissemination within clinical services kind of online or an app for example and finally just one last Kind of point in terms of culture and diversity you know all of the participants in the study were white british and i think that is something that needs to be think, uh, thought about in terms of how we can adapt and apply it to other kind of groups however there was massive variability in terms of NOAA diversity kind of uk location household income sexuality and many of the young people who were kind of in our intervention were from groups such as young people who are on the spectrum who often actually don't respond particularly well to interventions so it's really kind of positive the findings of this study kind of in that context so thank you Okay, that's great. Thank you, Tom. So we'll have more uh, questions for Tom at the end. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Dora Stefanidou now, who is our next speaker. If you can get your slides set up, Dora. Thank you, Jenna. Um, are you able to see my slides? It looks great. So when you're ready, thanks, Dora. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Dora Stefanidou, and I'm a research fellow at the Division of Psychiatry at UCL. And today I will be talking about the Community Navigator Program, which is a program of support to reduce loneliness and depression for adults with severe depression and anxiety using secondary mental health services. Uh, the second half of my talk will actually focus on testing the intervention through an RCT study. And just to say that the program is led by Dr. Bryn Lloyd Evans and Professor Sonia Johnson, as well as a team of collaborators. So a few things on the background of why this program of support was developed. So about one third of people with depression are not helped by antidepressants and can be termed as treatment resistant with less than half of them getting fully better with CBT. And we do know that in secondary mental health care, only about 40% of people with treatment resistant depression get fully better by 10 years follow up. So there is a real need for new types of support for people with TRD. So what kinds of new types of supports uh, can we develop? So people with depression have a tenfold increased risk of being lonely and loneliness independently predicts poor recovery from depression. And we also know that loneliness and social uh, connections are not really addressed in mental health services and that effective interventions for loneliness in mental health populations are lacking. So the idea is that intervening to improve loneliness could help reduce depression, which is something that has been addressed in previous talks as well. So a few, a few things on the intervention development. So the, the idea was to meet this gap and try to provide new types of support for people with severe mental illness. So academics at the Division of Psychiatry, uh, researchers, practitioners, and members with lived experience co-produced a program of support aiming to reduce loneliness and depression for people with severe uh, anxiety and depression. And the premise behind that was that if you increase social isolation, you can reduce loneliness. And as a result, you can reduce depression. And according to the social identity theory, enhanced identification as a member of um, a group or a community can actually improve a person's sense of self and well-being. So what is the intervention about? So the intervention includes 10 sessions of support with a community navigator. The community navigators are champions of the local community. They are not clinicians and they have expertise in supporting social participation in the community. So the intervention itself has three main components and I will quickly talk you through those. So network mapping, the navigators help people map out their social worlds. So the people, the places and the activities that they are important to them then they help them set goals and they break these goals into smaller steps. And finally, they provide emotional and practical support with the goals. And that could be locating social activities or helping people plan their traveling. 
So this is an example of the network mapping tool. So you can see uh, Dominic's social world here. So the people, the places and the activities that they are important to him. So a few things on testing the intervention. So what is it that we've done so far? So we've tested the intervention in a feasibility trial between 2016 and 2018. So we recruited 40 participants in two London NHS trusts. And so what is it that we found? We found that a trial is feasible. We were able to recruit and retain participants in the trial. And we also found that the intervention was delivered as intended and it was found to be helpful and acceptable by service users. So we had really promising results that made a strong case for a full trial to test the efficacy of the intervention. And that will take us to the second half of my talk, which is the RCT. So Bryn Lloyd Evans, Sonia Johnson and colleagues secured funding and IHR funding for a full RCT trial to test the community navigator program. So the trial is about to start and it's a two arm RCT. The intervention group will receive the community navigator program plus routine care and the control group will receive routine care plus an information booklet about local groups and activities. So we are aiming to recruit 306 participants across four sites, so two in London and two outside of London, 77 participants per site. People using secondary mental health services and those with treatment resistant depression will be eligible for participation and follow up assessments are scheduled at eight and 14 months. The primary outcome is depression as measured by the PHQ-9 at eight months, so at the end of treatment. And the study will run from September 2021 to February 2025. So here you can see a full list of the study team. So the chief investigators, Bryn Lloyd Evans, Sonia Johnson, Glenn Lewis is the senior trialist. Gergo Bart is the current trial manager and I used to be the trial manager till uh, May. Our MACPIN colleagues, statisticians, the site leads and um, a lived experience advisory group with nine members from York, Birmingham and London. So what is the primary hypothesis in this trial? The primary hypothesis is that people with treatment resistant depression receiving the community navigator program in addition to routine care will be less depressed measured using the PHQ-9 scale at eight month follow-up compared to the control group. And here you can see the participants journey in the trial and the follow-up points. So at baseline participants will be consented. We will screen for eligibility, screening mainly for loneliness and depression, and we will conduct the baseline measures. Then participants will be randomized and allocated to the intervention group or the control, control group. And all outcomes will be measured at eight months, which is the end of treatment time point and at 14 months, which is six months post-treatment. And we will also collect data on depression, loneliness, and some health economics at four and 11 months. And here you can see the outcome measures. So data on depression, loneliness, and other clinical and social outcomes, as well as service user outcomes, and some health economics measures as well are going to be collected. So the study timeline, the study started in September 2021, and we have so far secured um, ethics uh, by the Health Research Authority. The community navigators have been employed and trained, and the participant recruitment is about to start in June 2022. The first six months of the trial would be uh, the pilot period. Well, the, the trial will be uh, the, the recruitment and engagement rates will be assessed uh, by independent committees and the study will end in February 2025. So in three years time, we will know whether this program of support is actually successful. Um, and last slide for me, just to say that the RCT has a qualitative component. So during the first six months, we will aim to explore barriers to recruitment and engagement. And after the eight, eight month follow-up point, we will explore implementation challenges and the participants' experiences. The interviews will be led by our colleagues at McPean, and there will be- A few minutes, Dora. Great, thank you, Gemma. Leap involvement in the analysis. 
So yeah, the study is funded by NIHR. And thank you very much. Sorry if I spoke too quickly. <laughs> no, <laughs> thank you, Dora. You did not speak too quickly. That was excellent. Very clear. Right. Yeah, if you stop right. sharing. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Dora. So we'll have time for questions for Dora at the end. So our last presentation is from Simon Gilbody, who I think I saw. Oh, there. Hi, Simon. <laughs> um, so, yeah, if you want to get your slides ready, Simon. Oops, you're on mute. You'd have thought after two and a bit years <laughs> during lockdown, we would have learned where. Nope. Somebody had to uh, still be on mute. <laughs> Standard practice. Good. Now I've got to find. You're fine because Dora has put us two minutes ahead of schedule. So no pressure or anything. So Dora, you did a brilliant job setting the scene and keeping to time. So you give me an extra two minutes. So um, you might regret giving Simon an extra two minutes to speak. But listen, it's been a super conference today. I've really enjoyed it. And we put the cart before the horse a bit. So you had Leanne during the panel discussion talking about the Basel trial without really having the space to tell you about what the Basel trial was. So I'm going to use the next eight minutes, 10 minutes or so to tell you a bit more about Basel. I'll tell you a little bit about the pilot results and, um, and whet your appetite with what we might look for in the fully powered trial that's, um, that's coming on. So we've got a, a super group of people who've really gone the extra mile during the lockdown, during COVID, these past two years that have been so difficult for everyone, to deliver a programme of research that um, I think has moved us a little bit further in understanding how we might respond to social isolation and loneliness, particularly amongst older people. So this is the Basel programme. It's a trial, it's a systematic review, it's a series of qualitative studies. And I'll just talk about the trial results and a little bit about systematic review today. Basel stands for behavioural activation in social isolation and loneliness. And this is a really important study for us because this was um, adopted by the NIHR urgent public health program. I'll say a little bit more about that as we go on. So, um, so that's a nice photograph of our campus in New York. It didn't look like that this morning. Um, so let me move on. So what am I gonna say? I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about loneliness and depression in this particular at-risk group, older people with multiple long-term conditions. We've moved away from saying multimorbidity, but it's what people have been increasingly calling multimorbidity over the past 10 years, but um, we now call multiple long-term conditions. And we'll talk about trials, about how um, our body of um, researchers responded to the challenge of COVID-19. We, we, there haven't been too many trials in, um, um, in, in response to COVID-19. So this was one of only a small number of trials that have run in the UK. I'll talk about this pilot trial and I'll introduce you to the notion of a living systematic review. So I sort of rewind a little bit, two and a bit years, like many people, we were, um, everyone in the country was wondering what we were going to do socially and also what we were gonna do with research. So um, everything closed down in patient facing research, um, uh, the way in which studies were supported in the NHS just went into uh, uh, went onto a wartime footing, and um, we were quite anxious about that. So we've been working with a particular population of people, older people with multiple long term conditions, for many many years now. And we've we've got a three million pound program grant. So um, multi morbidity. Um, was at the focus of this programme grant. And we were all set to go. We've got a, a, an intervention that we thought would work to mitigate um, the psychological impacts of multimorbidity in a vulnerable population. We've been working with behavioural activation for a long time, behavioural activation. We think it's a parsimonious intervention. It works just as well as cognitive behaviour therapy, but the treatment and delivery requirements are somewhat less than CBT. So it's that more parsimonious response. So we've got an intervention, a manualised intervention, a co-produced intervention that was ready to go for this population. And, um, uh, and we were sort of looking around at what the papers, what the literature was saying. So, you know, all over the papers, all over the BBC, all over the Guardian, um, people were increasingly concerned about um, older people, people with long-term conditions, people who were seen to be medically vulnerable about how the 
protracted lockdown was going to impact on their mental health. So we thought, well, maybe we've got something to say in response to this. So how might we mitigate that psychological impact? Um, so we made a case to the Urgent Public Health Programme and they received numbers of hundreds of applications, but ours was the only trial of 93 studies that they supported across the NHS that focused on psychosocial interventions. The rest of them were often vaccine trials, studies to see if they could improve um, survival rates on intensive care units. The recovery trial, very famous programme of studies, um, was part of the UPH programme. So, the Basel study, which I'm going to talk about, was adopted by UPH and that allowed us to continue during COVID. So um, whilst many other studies were followed pretty much, we were able to receive the support to deliver a multi-centre study across many, many sites in the NHS. So, um, so this is our urgent public health study. And I'm not going to say too much about the you know, fine grained detail of the study because there's a website there. So if you Google Basel and my name, you'll hit this website. You can see a cheesy video of me talking about some of the early results there. And um, you'll see I've got the same wallpaper on that screenshot that I've got behind me now. So it's a very much live um, website that we've got for the Basel study. And it, it demonstrates a lot of the co-production that's gone on behind find the scenes to try and make this work. So I've said a little bit about behavioural activation already, and we're fans of behavioural activation. It's, it's been the centre of a, a large trials programme um, that has um, emerged from, from our group and we collaborate up and down the UK. And behavioural activation is a really neat intervention and it helps people maintain or introduce activities that are important to them to help them stay connected with the world and remain active. But the thing that we did, the very rapid transformation that we made in response to COVID, was behavioural formulation. And that wasn't too difficult to do. People quite spontaneously offered the main problem that they wanted to tackle within brief psychosocial interventions. And our lived experience panel also reinforced this notion was how might you find a way to um, maintain social contacts to try and mitigate social isolation. And there's a really neat, neat tool that you have in the toolbox, a trick in behavioural activation is you use something called functional equivalence. And it's probably worth reading a bit more about that. And we just made social connection and interaction the focus of this functional equivalence. So if you couldn't see your friends down at the bingo, how else might you maintain that social contact? And this was a really powerful mechanism during um, the, the Basel intervention. So that nicely integrates the sort of social and the psychological within this formulation, within a behavioural formulation. And we weren't going to be able to see people face to face. So we also piloted, and it worked really well, this delivery of this intervention remotely. So we gave people the option to use it by video, by WhatsApp, or just by the boring old um, telephone or um, a very basic um, uh, mobile phone. And everyone went pretty much to a person with the use of the telephone. And it was offered over eight sessions delivered weekly with behavioral support workers. We trained them over a two day program to be able to deliver this intervention. So I'll give you the pine, results of the pilot. And the three month results have already been published in PLOS Medicine at the back end of last year. So it, interesting pilot study. And it's a biggish pilot study. So it's um, uh, we'd aim to recruit 100 participants and um, recruitment went really well. So we didn't do that final mail out because we thought we'd got enough people to be able to answer our question about whether we could recruit and retain and deliver the intervention and to see if there's some signal of effect there. So we got just short of 100 participants. We got really, really, really good follow up rates. So one of the things that threatens the validity of the science within trials are uh, high levels of attrition or differential levels of attrition. So we got over 90% at one month, we got exactly 90% at three months, and then we still maintained a follow-up rate of over 80% at 12 months. And when we offered this intervention over the telephone using a behavioural formulation to look at social interaction using um, functional equivalence, um, 44 out of the 47 participants that were offered behavioural activation actually engaged with that. And if you engage with it, you pretty much engage with the whole um, programme. So on average, 5.8 sessions averaged across everyone who received or was offered the intervention. Um, and that's pretty good. That's pretty comparable. So here are the results. And it's got 
some caveats, terms and conditions apply, but I'll, I'll talk about the, the full battery of outcome measures and I'll present them using a, a forest plot format where I've standardized the measures and I've made sure that the measures all point in the same direction so that you can see how each of the outcome measures stacks up. And then I'll focus on loneliness and depression. Two so minutes, Simon. Have we got two minutes? Yeah. Excellent. So here we've got the three month results and um, uh, look at it in the paper, but we got a really strong signal of effects in producing a statistically significant reduction in levels of loneliness with the de Jong scale. And um, we couldn't tell where it was with the other outcomes. When we got to 12 months, um, everything seems to be pointing in the same direction, but we used some quality of life measures and we got a statistically significant effect at 12 months not on the loneliness measures, not on the depression measures, but on the mental component scale of the short form 12 questionnaire, which looks at quality of life. Um, but the final thing I'll show is how we used these trial results to contribute to a living systematic review or meta-analysis. And just to say, this pilot trial, we then progressed to do a fully powered trial. So we've now recruited um, uh, just about 450 participants to what is now the largest ever cognitive or behavioral trial. The, uh, uh, of an intervention to mitigate depression or loneliness. So um, I'll fast forward to our living systematic review. So here, whilst we were doing the trial, what we did was we added the basal results to all the other trials that had been undertaken, cognitive or behavioral interventions. So we know now what the totality of randomized evidence looks like. And as I go anti-clockwise here, so loneliness measures, there were about 11 very smallish studies where Basel, even as the pilot study, is the largest study that's in there. And we get a very strong signal of effect for loneliness, reducing that um, um, with a standard effect size of 0.41. So that's a moderate effect size. So we can be confident that cognitive or behavioral interventions do actually reduce loneliness in the short term. But there aren't many long-term studies. So when we receive the results, the 12 month results of the Basel Plus study, which is our fully powered study, we will have a significant contribution to randomized evidence, both in the short term and the long term. And we can see over on the other side that it also reduces levels of depression in the short term and in the longer term, but we do need a longer term study. So that's me, loneliness, we do know increased under COVID, but under COVID, we also delivered the largest ever trial of the behavioral or cognitive intervention for loneliness. And we feel we've made some small advance in the science and made some sense of the evidence. And I think, you know, should heaven forbid COVID strike again, then we're perhaps a little bit better equipped to tackle loneliness and depression, particularly in at-risk groups. And this remains a credible intervention. But we should have the results of the fully powered trial probably within about six months and they'll enter the public domain at that point. So I'll stop talking then. Thank you very much, Gemma. Thank you, Simon. It's really interesting. So exciting. OK, so, yeah, if you could just stop sharing your screen, Simon. So uh, brilliant. Thank you so much, everybody. So there was really four really interesting talks there about sort of different populations and also interventions within different settings as well. So really interesting and promising. Um, exciting findings. So we now have 15 minutes for a discussion. Would anybody in the audience like to start us off with any questions for any of the speakers? Hi there, Roz. Hi, so Hi. just looking to put my head up. So I'm going to try and put a question back to you guys. <laughs> We were asked in a panel discussion earlier. So if we sort of put it all, all the different things together that are effective, how, how is how is it best to do that? Bearing in mind the principle of parsimony, different approaches seem to work. How can we how can we think about keeping the best of everything, not being overwhelming, giving music options and modularity and social stuff? Thanks, Roz. So that a question sort of about sort of implementation pathways type thing, which I was also thinking about. Does anybody from the panel like to uh, answer? So Roz gave us a clue to that because I caught the first bit of the panel discussion and um, she said that she's guided by the evidence. I think that's a good place to start. So um, we've seen a series of interventions presented today that seem to come from different theoretical perspectives and in some ways they might collide. But um, 
Um, we've also seen some evidence that things might potentially work. So um, I once heard someone say rhetorically, um, we've seen it work in practice. I'm sure we can make it work in theory. So, uh, <laughs> so I don't think you should be too constrained by theory. You know, there are lots of theories that can use that describe the same thing. So I guess I've shown how we can use a behavioral formulation to focus on um, some social aspects of, um, of isolation and um, how those sit together quite nicely and how you can sort of reconcile the two. So some rapprochement would be my suggestion and be guided by evidence. Thanks, Simon. Somebody, anybody else from the panel like to comment on Ross's question? I think part of it is, at least in my mind, about having different like layers of, of interventions or layers of kind of options for different people. So if you take a kind of a, a kind of a CBT or a behavioral intervention, whether it's modular or not, that is kind of one thing for some people where kind of psychological therapy would be really helpful. But then you can also kind of slot that together with other things. So if you think about kind of music interventions, which may be an amazing thing for people who really like music, but what happens if you're so anxious you can't go to the intervention because the idea of going to a group is so terrifying that you won't be able to talk to people so therefore if you actually slotted in before that a kind of a psychological say cbt style intervention to reduce social anxiety so that someone who loves music is then able to go to a group where they can connect with others about their love with music you know you could see how these things can kind of work together maybe thank you yeah so like a step step to care type approach that was a really interesting point I thought you made in a presentation about the social anxiety I hadn't thought about before these are sort of preventing these young people from doing group-based activities yeah Dora I think apart from the intervention development what we found in the community navigator is that the choice of the interventionists is really important so who are the people that they are delivering the intervention and are they liked by the service users and in the qualitative interviews at the feasibility trial, I think that was a big part of satisfaction with the program. People just really enjoyed working with the navigator. And I guess here there is this danger of ending just doing a befriending <laughs> service, which we need to... Is that coming for me? Yeah, sorry. So, so could you... Uh, yeah, okay, it's gone. Carry yeah, on, Dora. To account for, but I, I think choice of staff and training people is is what we found to be really important. Great, yeah, so some aspects of therapeutic alliance and patient preferences and stuff like that, very important, yeah. Great, okay, so we have uh, Angela Richards has a hand up. Hello. Hi, Angela. Hi, I thought um, the presentation was absolutely amazing, actually, um, these interventions. Be, um, I mean, um, Simon spoke um, quite a lot about um, the characteristics um, like the age and things like that but it'd be interesting to know a bit more about um, these interventions um, how they were tailored for particular um, communities because this is community interventions so overall were there for example um, people of um, um, visible um, differences maybe people who were um, um, had um, mobility problems, for example, because that can affect um, how much your depression um, is, it can affect your depression. And also people from different, maybe um, racialized, racialized minorities. So um, I'm hearing, maybe I've missed it, but it seems that those kinds of um, characteristics are, are getting overlooked or maybe I've just missed it and they're not being reported explicitly. All right, thanks, Angela. Anybody from the panel like to offer a response to that? Interesting, very interesting. That says it all, doesn't it, really? So I was giving other people a chance to answer, mm. so please, please don't um, uh, interpret my silence as having nothing in response to your really excellent question, Angela. So um, I'll tackle the, the physical disabilities and limitations um, aspect of that, if that's OK. Yeah. Do. So I mean, the, the first thing is we um, work with a group of older people who were, by definition, often physically quite limited by virtue of having two or more long term conditions. So those were often quite severely physically limiting conditions like heart failure, um, recently had strokes or um, several of our participants had long term chronic respiratory illness. And um, um, so, so the, um, the, the way in which the intervention was delivered was contextualized 
with the help of a, a really excellent group of people who are, were our experts by experience. So we had co-applicants and people on our steering committee and on our trial delivery um, group who um, uh, had lived experience of either um, uh, long-term physical health problems or cared for someone with a long-term mm, physical okay. health problem. They, they talked about the importance of um, ensuring that all the exercises or the um, uh, bits of homework that came up and were in the manuals um, took specific account of people's physical limitations. So I guess that would be a, an example of the way in which we um, responded to the, the you know the inclusivity and the um the particular challenges of the population that we we were working i um, would have thought maybe things like um dementia may also have been relevant or mild cognitive impairment indeed yeah so um so again thinking about a population of older people um if people had quite profound cognitive impairment um, they probably didn't take part in the trial, but we tried to be inclusive by ensuring mm -hmm. that um, it wasn't dependent upon um, completing homework sessions in between sessions. And we also work very closely with carers in the delivery of the intervention. So people could have um, work in a dyad with someone that they lived with or that cared for them. So, um, so that wasn't an exclusion for us, our population. That's a great answer. Thank you very much indeed, Simon. Thanks, Angela. And I suppose it speaks to yeah, the general points we've heard from a lot of trials. And I think we do know that, you know, trials are you know, very strong design for causal inference, but they do often result in quite, you know, uh, unrepresentative samples. And there's definitely a need for interventions to be tailored to marginalised groups. Okay, thanks. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that point. OK, uh, Rosie. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree that we, we need to be far more inclusive and diverse with, with our trials. Just, um, I was involved in the Songs from Home project that George spoke about, and um, one of the reasons that we used an online intervention was to address some of these barriers that parents have told us about. We're going to in-person music groups, so taking a, ba taking a young baby to a place, having to be there at a certain time, worries perhaps about being able to breastfeed freely in that space when others are around. And so one of the reasons that we wanted to do this online, which of course comes with its own limitations, especially with music, because sound <laughs> problems and stuff. But one of the reasons mm. that we wanted to do it online was to try and be more inclusive of people who may not otherwise be able to get out to parent activities. So that was sort of part of our thinking. Um, and in the PPI work we did, um, we did find that parents were, it, it, we did PPI work with people who had experienced loneliness or PND in the past. Um, and we talked to them about, you know, what it was like to go to activities um, during that time. And there were a lot of parents saying, yeah, it's it was difficult for me to get out. But equally, there were people saying, actually, it's difficult to stay home as well, because getting out of the house can sometimes be a really good thing in terms of how I feel and my mental health. And then we saw the same with our evaluation work. A lot of the participants really valued the, the online context and others said yeah it was lovely but I think it would have been even better <laughs> if we'd been in a room mm. together so we see this really mixed picture and it comes back to the whole you know trying to personalize this mm. um you know and offer what works for different people and it's it's that's the ideal of course but the pragmatics of that are not always easy to sort of um to come to but but yeah that's the reason that we we tried this online was to try and address some of the barriers that we've been told about in terms of getting to in-person music sessions that's great Rosie thank you very much yeah, thank you, Rosie. That's a good point. And that sort of picks up on a theme across all of the presentations, I think, wasn't there, with um, these online interventions delivered digitally. And I guess there is an interesting tension there, isn't there, between increasing accessibility, you know, you can just turn up in your pyjamas, but also, you know, you don't have, you don't have that in-person connection. Yeah, Simon. I was just going to add to something. It, it occurs to me as we're you know, thinking about interventions in response to Lots and lots of things that the whole world seems to be moving digital just at the mm. moment. And, um, you know, that might or might not be a good thing. So it does have the potential to improve access, but also it also has the potential to exclude people. So the digital divide is a very real thing. And it it came up in our uh, some of our um, qualitative focus groups that older people were sometimes, but not always, um, often quite threatened by um, uh the wholesale shift of care to a digital format within the NHS. And that happened in a big way during COVID. So the digital divide was a real thing. So we made our intervention deliberately quite low tech. So it was 
printed booklets that people work through rather than the assumption they download an app. And they use it a conventional landline in many occasions rather than the requirement that you needed a smartphone. So, um, so digital is not always inclusive and um, it's good to have a, a sort of a suite of things and be mindful of the, the digital divide that does have the potential to amplify health inequalities rather than to reduce them. Yeah, thanks, Simon. That's a really good point. I may actually just ask Tom about that as well, because I suppose this digital divide is spoken a lot about in terms of older adults, isn't it? But I'm aware that it's also a thing for young people, even though people don't assume it's a thing for young people. So I wonder, you know, but with your CBT and about uh, you thought about that at all? Yeah, no, I think that's a really, really good point. I think when we chose to do it, we didn't have the option of doing it face to face because we course, started in, I yeah. think it was the second wave that we we kind of begun. And I think in, in, in many ways, we were concerned that it could be a barrier. And we really thought about, you know, we gave the option of running the sessions from schools, from support groups, you know, buying kind of webcams, you know, whatever um, that we felt could, you know, try and in increase or improve accessibility. But actually, a lot of the young people spoke about it being very much the other way around. Like, you know, several young people spoke that they, you know, had really significant difficulties with social anxiety and were not able to kind of engage in therapy face to face or hadn't been able to go to the clinic and they had been able to do that remotely, which is really positive. But also actually we were able to work with young people. I mean, literally the breadth of, of the UK, even though obviously it's quite a, a small sample. And you know, many of the young people were living in communities where you know the CAMS waiting list were four years, where there just wasn't access to, to evidence-based treatments that we were then able to offer as part of this research study. So I think in, in many ways it actually really opened it up to lots of young people rather than necessarily just kind of excluded um, kind of groups. Brilliant, thank you, Tom. So I think we are supposed to be ending at, oh, this is the issue of my computer being, clock being fast again. Okay, we're supposed to be ending in two minutes. Um, so I guess I'll just take that time to say, thank you so much to all of the speakers. These are all really interesting, uh, really promising findings. It's really nice to see some sort of trials emerging with really um, uh, promising effects and. Thank you all so much for talking about those. Um, so, yeah, I think Eddie's going to be closing these breakout rooms at, at 22. There's then a break and we'll then be back at 10 to for a panel discussion on next steps for addressing loneliness, social isolation in the context of mental health. OK, so, yeah, thank you so much again, everybody. And yeah, do feel free to join the main session again or go for a coffee break. Thank you so much.